Ezekiel 34 offers us what initially seems a comforting and familiar image of God. This is the God who seeks as a shepherd seeks for their sheep. It's an image of God seeking for the lost sheep. And I'm sure we're instantly thinking of uh, Luke chapter 15 and Jesus' wonderful, beautiful parable of the lost sheep. This is a, a familiar and comfortable image. But we should have learnt by now that seldom in the prophets is the idea of comfort and familiarity left unchallenged. This image does not remain a cosy image. We're told that God will feed with justice. I will judge between sheep and sheep, says Ezekiel. And the image that is given in this passage in Ezekiel 34 is a, an image of some of the sheep as, um, as fat and, uh, and greedy and strong sheep and others as weak and thin. This week, we've had a difficult set of mixed messages coming from one part of government. I, do, do you like the way that sometimes we find that new language enters, enters into our world? Words that we've not heard together before. And this week's priceless gem was the idea of unintentional bullying. I, I'm sorry, but that really gets my goat. The idea that bullying can be unintentionable. I suppose it's, I suppose it's possible that you don't realise that what you are doing is having an effect on others. I suppose that might be something that is worth exploring. Your own inability to recognise how what you do affects those around you. But there is nothing in this passage, in Ezekiel 34, that speaks of unintentional bullying. This is a passage about those who will force themselves to the front and trample on others in the process of doing so. And, and Ezekiel is very clear, God will judge in this system. God will bring justice for the poor and the downtrodden, the neglected and the marginalized. What I love about the lectionary readings is the way that we see old and new brought in parallel to one another and, and given the opportunity to discuss and to, to work off each other. I love the way that today our Ezekiel reading of God seeking out the lost sheep, and then judging between the strong and the weak is an image that is taken up by Jesus himself in his famous illustrated story, illustrated sermon towards the end of Matthew's gospel. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he shall judge How will he judge? Who will he judge? All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people from one, one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. When the Son of Man comes in all his glory, there will be a judgment. There will be a separation. And we should, and we're right, we should ask, what is the difference between the sheep and the goats? This is not one of those 
questions as to which you would rather have for lunch. A bit of goat curry, curry goat. Well, that sounds rather nice, actually. Or, or a pot of a spot of roast lamb. This is not a question about which do you prefer, but rather in the context of the story, in the context of the sermon, in the context of the illustration, which would you rather be? The sheep or the goats? The way that the illustration is set up is to demonstrate that there is a difference based on the way that we have lived and the way that we have behaved. And instantly our old evangelical hackles are raised. Surely this is not going to teach us that actually salvation is about what we do rather than what God has already done. And of course it's not. But this story is saying that the way that we live in response to what God has done for us will in itself be judged. We should ask ourselves, what was the difference between the sheep and the goats? And amazingly, not amazingly, amazingly it's exactly the same message that we as a church have been hearing through the last three months as we've worked our way through the minor prophets isn't it amazing how it's again the same familiar message that God has a bias to the poor the weak the neglected the downtrodden that God will judge us on how we have treated others. We should stop and ask what is the difference between the sheep and the goats. And the, the difference is not what they had or even necessarily just what they did, but rather how they treated those who had nothing. In the story, it's about the poor, the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, the prisoner. How did we respond to those in need? And in the illustrated sermon, the Son of Man comes in all his glory and separates the sheep from the goats on the basis of how they treated the poor, the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and the prisoner. How do we judge whether a church is healthy or not? How do we judge whether a Christian life is faithful or not? Is it the size of the building? Is it the talent of the worship group? Is it the profile of the minister? Or is it who is fed? Is it how the stranger, the alien in our midst, in our context, perhaps the refugee, the asylum seeker, the homeless, how are they helped and transformed by the good news, not just of God's bias for them but the fact that God has given us resources to help them to transform them to change their lot there is a justice message at the heart of all we do so we should ask what is the difference between the sheep and the goats 
It's how they treat those who have nothing. But I think there is another question to ask yet still. This sermon is preached in the lectionary on a Sunday that is known as Christ the King Sunday. Yes, I know it's Stir Up Sunday as well, and we should be doing our Christmas puddings today, apparently. And I'm looking and thinking, how many others are, are, are doing? No, Aldi have got a very good deal on Christmas puddings. But it's Christ the King Sunday. The Sunday first before Advent, the Sunday at the end of the Christian year, the Sunday before the start of the Christian year. A Sunday for remembering Christ in all his glory. Christ as the King. So look again at this passage from Matthew and ask, where is Christ the King to be found? When the Son of Man comes in all his glory and all the angels with him to sit in judgment, is that where we find Christ the King? Or do we need to look further and deeper into this story and ask, where is Christ the King to be found in the story of judgment that Jesus tells? For again and again and again in this story, we are told that Christ is to be found in the person who hungers and thirsts. Christ is to be found in the stranger and the one who is naked. Christ is to be found in the one who is sick, the one who is a prisoner. Some of you will have seen on our Facebook feed this week that I reminded you of uh, a song written many years ago by uh, an artist, Keith Green. He doesn't so much sing this story as uh, he basically just reads the passage whilst pay, playing the piano enthusiastically. He does it with drama and melodrama and humour and pathos. He, he somehow manages to communicate the shock that both groups of people have. Those who are told that all is well and those who are told that all is not all seem surprised. And the difference between them is whether or not people recognize that in the poor and the lost, they are encountering Jesus himself. Where is Christ the King to be found in this story? Christ the King is hungry and thirsty Christ the King is a stranger. Christ the King is naked, sick, in prison. I love the poetry of Malcolm Geit, who until very recently was um, chaplain at Girton College, Cambridge. I believe he still lives in the area. He's uh, focusing more on his writing work. He's published many wonderful books of collections of poetry and also meditations on other work. Hear his sonnet for this day, Christ the King. Hear his sonnet reflection on this passage from Matthew 25. Our King is calling from the hungry furrows, whilst we are cruising through the aisles of plenty. Our hoardings screen us from the man of sorrows. Our soundtracks drown his murmur, I am thirsty. He stands in line to sign in as a stranger and seek a welcome from the world he made. And we see him only as a threat, a danger. He asks for clothes, we strip search him instead. 
and if he should fall sick, then we take care that he does not infect our private health. We lock him in the prisons of our fear, lest he unlock the prison of our wealth. But still, on Sunday, we shall stand and sing the praises of our hidden Lord and King. Where will we find Christ the King today and in the days ahead? Will we find him as the Son of Man, come in all his glory on a, on a throne, crowned, ready to judge? Or will we dare to find him in the lost and the lonely, the poor and the neglected, the marginalised, the hurting, the stranger, Will we dare to seek Christ the King incarnated in this world? Let us pray. Lord, reveal yourself to us, we pray, in the world all around us. And in the making known of yourself, may we find ourselves known too. Amen.